with another Fat Bear Week in the books and one of the United States' largest national parks filled with fat, successful brown bears. It's time to celebrate the summer that was and look toward the future of Katmai National Park and Preserve. Hi, everyone. My name is Mike Fitz. I'm the resident naturalist with Explore.org and a member of the board of directors for the Katmai Conservancy. Sarah, I think you're muted. My co-host okay, here we go. this broadcast today. Yeah. Hey, thanks, Sarah. <laughs> Welcome. Thanks for being here. Hi, everyone. Yeah, glad to be here. <laughs> My name is Sarah Wolman, and I'm the media and project manager for the Katmai Conservancy, which is the official friends group of my favorite place, Katmai National Park and Preserve. I'd like to thank you all so much for joining us today to celebrate these amazing fat bears and the ecosystem that they live in. So, Mike, what is today all about? Well, we're in the midst of the Katmai Conservancy's annual fundraising campaign. This is called the Otis Fund. And through the Otis Fund, you can help support the Conservancy's efforts to provide education and interpretation of the park, research on brown bears and the human history of the area, uh, support youth engagement in the local communities and online, and of course, ensure the uh, ecological stability of Katmai. And Explore.org has generously agreed to match all donations to the Otis Fund up to $250,000, believe it or not, before midnight tonight on October 10th. Uh, so that's midnight tonight. In the past week, you've already donated about $100,000. So thank you to everyone who has done that so far and being so generous. Uh, you can find links to, do to donate in the feature comment below the live camera feed on this page. And over the next hour, Sarah, I think we have a lot to share uh, with everyone today. So maybe we should get to it. What's uh, first on, on tap? Sure, sure. So first and foremost, we'd like to acknowledge the traditional lands of the Shugpiak people that Fat Bear Week is held upon. So please welcome Katmai Conservancy Board member and Bristol Bay Native Corporation shareholder, Andrea Egley. Hi, everyone. My name is Andrea Egley, and I am a board member for the Katmai Conservancy. I am Sukhbiak with family ties to the old village of Sevanoski within Katmai National Park. I grew up in Ganuye, the Yupik name for the town of South Naknik, which is a small fishing village on the Naknik River. I currently live in Anchorage, Alaska, which is home to the ancestral lands of the Dena Inna Athabascan people. And much like the bears that return every summer to feed on the fish in Brooks River, so did my ancestors, and they did that for thousands of years. And so I want to acknowledge their stewardship of the land and the resources that is now Katmai National Park. I also want to honor the culture and the history and the traditional knowledge that is very much alive and well today. I also want to thank Guy at the Katmai Conservancy for recognizing the importance of land acknowledgement. It's a way to honor the original people of the land and having members understand who took care of and occupied this land before colonization is important, especially as the Katmai Conservancy strives to protect and preserve all that is Katmai National Park. So Guyana, thank you for allowing me to acknowledge the lands of the Sukhbak people. And I wanna thank each and every one of you for celebrating Fat Bear Week with us. Guyana. Thank you so much, Andrea. Today we're going to be celebrating two of my favorite things, brown bears and Katmai National Park and Preserve. So I used to work as a ranger out at Katmai and being immersed in such an incredible ecosystem absolutely changed my life. The fact that I could be sitting in my cabin, eating dinner, watching these huge animals saunter by just outside my window never ceased to amaze me. Each bear has such a personality and you can really see the intelligence behind their eyes. Uh, I would stand out there for hours on, on patrol watching bears solve complex problems, interact with each other, and that's just the tip of the iceberg for how amazing these creatures are. 
Katmai is also just so much more than these amazing brown bears that we've all come to know and love. It's home to the spawning grounds of salmon, has incredible volcanic landscapes, and is also home to rich traditional cultures. I could go on and on and on for hours about Katmai. So Mike, why don't you tell us a little bit about your love of bears and Katmai? Well, I think we could both go on and on for hours, but we will spare our audience that. But I, I do have... <laughs> You know some things that I I, I want to share. Uh, I, I often think back to when I first arrived at Katmai um, in 2007 and how awestruck I was by the scale of the area's wildness. And even today, that feeling really has never left me. E each time I, re I return to Katmai, I get that same sort of sensation uh, of of awe and wonder. And I cherish many of the moments of, of wonder that I've experienced in the park. The times I trekked into the Valley of 10,000 Smokes, uh, not speaking a word or seeing a person for days at a time. And I'll never forget, of course, watching rivers uh, fill with salmon, uh, the thousands of hours that I spent getting to know the brown bears of Brooks River, and the look of amazement on people's faces when they come to the river and they see their first brown bear. Katmai is... I think also very special because through the partnership between the National Park Service, the Katmai Conservancy and Explore.org, we can share a remarkable wildlife watching experience with people around the world on the bear cams. The cams allow us to watch bears across their entire lives. And there's no other place that I can think of that gives the public that really that same opportunity with, with brown bears and with wildlife. Uh, so there are places with volcanoes there are places with salmon and there are places with bears and there's of course places with a long human history but there's only one katmai it is unlike any other place on earth and if you want to share with um with us and with everybody what you um or what katmai means to you then please uh, drop a comment into in the chat below we'd love to read those um either during or after uh the broadcast uh, of course Stewarding uh, such a, a special place takes a lot of work, and the federal agency tasked with that challenge is the National Park Service. Sarah and I have both worked as rangers at Katmai, and working as a ranger gives one a particular insight into that challenge. Uh, the National Park Service is uh, given a mission to conserve the park landscapes, including things like scenery, history, and wildlife, yeah. while leaving those spaces unimpaired for future generations and the enjoyment of current generations. So let's hear from Mark Sturm right now. He's the superintendent of Katmai National Park and he's currently tasked with that challenge. Hi, my name is Mark Sturm, the current superintendent at Katmai National Park and Preserve. I'm speaking to you today from King Salmon, Alaska, which is where the park is headquartered. You know, Katmai is a remarkable park for its expanse and for the cultural and natural resources that it helps to conserve. It's also unique because it's off the road system and somewhat difficult to access. To get here, you have to come to one of our gateway communities and typically take a float plane or a boat to access the interior reaches of the park. We just got through another week of Fat Bear Competition 2021. And I'd like to thank, I'd like to thank all the viewers who helped participate and, and cast votes from around the world. Fat bears are really remarkable. Uh, and they're indicative of a healthy ecosystem. And more broadly, they're indicative of a healthy ecological region, like the Bristol Bay region of Alaska. Katmai is, is home to an area with more brown bears than people, and the largest sockeye salmon runs remaining in the wild in the world. We couldn't have done the fat bear competition this year without our friends from explore.org. I'd like to thank them, and I'd also like to thank the Katmai Conservancy, the park's friends group for their assistance this year. The Katmai Conservancy is, is truly a, a good friend of ours. We work on a lot of shared priorities and initiatives together that range from natural and cultural resource management to management in general, and, and our, our efforts to continue to expand uh, outreach and education regionally, uh, locally, and nationally. We look forward to continuing to work with the Katmai Conservancy I'd like to thank everyone that's watching for their support of the Conservancy and the park. We hope we can raise some money to, to, to continue the good work that we've begun, and I look forward to what we can achieve together. Thanks for your support. Have a great day. Thank you so much, Mark, for being a great steward of Katmai National Park and Preserve. 
Next up, we have an update from Guy Runco, the Katmai Conservancy's Executive Director. Hi, I'm Guy Runco, Executive Director of the Katmai Conservancy, coming to you today from Anchorage, Alaska. Thank you for joining us for this special Fat Bear celebration. I'd like to first thank our incredible partners at Katmai National Park and Preserve and Explore.org for making Fat Bear Week possible. I'd also like to thank you, fans and supporters of Katmai National Park and our amazing bears. Speaking of, congrats to Otis, bear number 480, for securing his fourth Fat Bear title. Katmai Conservancy is the official nonprofit partner of Katmai National Park. Our mission is to support the preservation of Katmai National Park and Preserve, including its unique wildlife, ecosystems, scenic character, and natural and cultural resources by promoting greater public interest and appreciation through education, interpretation, and research. This week, we're asking you to support Katmai Conservancy by contributing to the Otis Fund, an annual donation drive centered around Fat Bear Week. Donations raised through the Otis Fund allow us to continue to help Katmai National Park in so many ways, including providing funding for important research on Katmai's brown bears and the area's extensive human history, promoting youth engagement within and outside of the park, and of course, providing assistance with the Explore.org live bear camps, to name just a few. If you haven't already, please take a moment to visit our website, katmiconservancy.org, and show your love for Katmai National Park and Preserve by contributing to the Otis Fund today. There's no better time to give, as our generous partners at Explore.org will match your donation, dollar for dollar, up to an incredible $250,000. Otis and the Bears will thank you. Thanks for joining us again today, and thanks for participating in Fat Bear Week. Let's get back to the celebration. Thanks again to Guy, the executive director of the Katmai Conservancy for that message. I'm certainly gl glad we have him on our team and I enjoy working with him. Let's pivot for a moment though uh, to the bear camps, the windows which allow so many of us to enjoy Katmai from afar. Earlier this week, I spoke with Charlie Annenberg, who is a huge bear fan, as many people know, and the founder of Explore.org. We talked about his love of bears and his thoughts on the webcam experience. I'm speaking with the founder of Explore.org and a huge brown bear fan, Charlie Annenberg. Charlie, thanks so much for taking the time to join me today. Uh, thank you, Mike. It's always a pleasure to speak with you. So any opportunity, I'm here. What did you think about Fat Bear Week this year? It was quite the event. You know, this season was quite the event. Um, I followed it since the beginning. And it was really a season like no other beginning with a lack of salmon showing up and it was only the dominant bears followed by this incredible salmon run and maybe 50 bears at Brooks, which I've never seen like almost every day, aggressive 909's cub, but there was always one missing element and the fans were hurting. And even on you on July 26th, kind of hinted that our beloved Otis might not be returning. The fans are really getting sad, even though there was so much action. And I remember the evening of July 27th, seeing this kind of scrawny, thin bear making his way up from the Riffles Cam to the Brooks River. And it was like the world cork champagne bottles. I'd never seen such happiness that Otis had returned. I mean, no one believed it. I'd heard stories. The latest he'd come is July 11th. I have to admit, I'd written them off myself. I, I really didn't think that our Otis was coming. And so uh, now let's cut to Fat Bear Week. I mean, what you have is one of the great comeback stories of all time. I mean, the four time now Fat Bear champ and the also the Otis fund, you can't be a more accredited bear. He's the most beloved bear in the world. I thought Fat Bear Week was amazing. I mean, I was, I always look at it differently. I can't believe how much it's grown. So first of all, just congratulations and kudos to the Katmai Conservancy and you, Mike, for really creating what is one of the most wonderful, spectacular, educational fun tournaments in the world. I mean, they compare it to March Madness now. The amount of press that wrote about it, if anyone Googles it, I mean, every major newspaper, internet, newspaper, press, wrote about it. And 
you know, it just celebrates that nature's working and it celebrates our beloved bears. I enjoyed the little chonky cub contest. I was a little concerned that the cub was going to make it to the finals. That was kind of pet peeving me a little bit. I have to be honest. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I, I am so touched by how touched people are by Otis bear 480. I really didn't truly appreciate it. Although I've watched them all season grow. I thought myself that, 747 and uh you know to walker you've been a gracious second place but to anyone who's seen walker in the office his size this season was truly spectacular but i have to remind myself that bears don't care like us humans and otis otis had a deeper meaning to people um our twitter feed alone we put it out as over six thousand retweets i mean it's amazing this bear touches the heart and souls of people. And so it was the best fat bear week ever. Um, we're now doing the Otis, I call it lifetime achievement award, the Otis fund. And, uh, you know, I'm a little, uh, I'll be sad. I, I really enjoy bear season. So it's um, kind of hard for this old bear to say he's going to go hibernate soon. <laughs> Yeah, it was amazing to see Otis's transformation this year. I think he did an incredible job, and I think people identified with his ability to persevere and his uh, story of resilience and an ability to get fat, um, and that'll set him up for success to survive this winter. And Otis has been a stalwart uh, and anchor of the Bear Cam experience since Bear Cam went live back in 2012. And I've always been curious to know, uh, Charlie, what drew you to the Bears at Brooks River? Why did you think this place would be such a great fit for webcams? You know, sometimes a little luck helps. I've I've always been in awe of Bears, um, but as someone who's also trained in film, I just knew the visual of the running water. You have salmon, bears, 24-hour light, and you have so many characters and personalities in nature showing up every day and it just gets better with each year because i don't know as a dog lover you kind of grow closer to the bears each year the more you get to know them you see offspring showing up um so you know i was just it just all worked out i i i couldn't think of a i don't think there's a better nature experience in the world than what's provided at Katmai because there's not many experiences left where you got to celebrate nature working. I mean, the fact that we're talking about Fat Bear Week, which is really cute and I love it, is a testament to, you know, nature working. It's a testament to the work you do and the rangers and fish and game. I mean, it just means something is working and we don't get that many stories anymore. And that's what makes Katmai so spectacular is you get to celebrate a story that's working. And um, I just the uh, highest honor to be a steward to these cams. I mean, I our to our fans out there probably don't know this, but <clears throat> every morning I review every photo taken on explore.org. I've seen every photo, um, you know, so I see all the magical moments. And that is a um, lot of photos. Yes, it is. Gotten quite good at it. <laughs> and uh, but it's great fun. It brings me so much joy and happiness and it's made me even feel closer. And that's why, you know, our fans are, um, I don't know if, know if the word fans are the right word, but you know, it's like in sports, you're the sixth fan. I mean, you guys help us out so much by documenting and archiving and talking about what's going on. And, and you know, the bears are the bears. They are in the salmon. I can't leave out the salmon because they're the real heroes here and the birds and it's just i if anyone has a suggestion of a place as unique as cat my please share it with me but i just think it's a special place and you kind of hinted i think a little bit at uh towards the answer for this next question um just a moment ago you know kind of talking about like the characters and the individuality of some of these bears uh, but what do you think that bears can and salmon uh can teach us as as humans well, let's just start with Otis, since he's our fat bear champ. Uh, patience, perseverance, 
you know, um, kind of like a benevolent ruler. Like when the other bears fight, he'll, he looks him in the eye, but he doesn't pick it. I mean, salmon, they're so unique. I scratch my head. I mean, talk about a selfless journey. I mean, they're fighting these streams, fighting the odds just to lay their eggs and die. You know, you put it together, and like I said, integrity, perseverance, patience, a little charm, a little personality to boot. I think those are traits that even in like the last two years that have been challenging, uh, you know, inspire you. And, and you know, I, I read a lot of the quotes from people and it's like, I, I go back to Otis and 747 and 856. I mean, they're all bears in their 20s. They teach us that we can graze gracefully, but it's not over till it's over. You know, it's all a mindset. And so in life, we adapt to circumstance. That's what we saw with these bears like Otis. He's not as aggressive. He's so patient. You think he's sleeping half the time. And then yet I have on my my drive so many catches by that bear. Like, but you wouldn't even know it. He's so stealth. He's so zen. But I, I, I think there's also just a message about adaptability and change as part of life. And we have to sometimes face that but not complain on the way. The bears just, you don't see them. You know, they just keep making do. So they're, they're truly, there's a lot, there's a lot to be said, you know? And, and I, I'll take it a step further. If we could figure out hybridation and how to slow our heartbeats down, that's gonna be the future of a lot of things in society. If you wanna talk about space travel and all these things, you're gonna have to learn from these bears a lot more. I think there's a ton they can teach us. Yeah. So um, we'll maybe we'll try to have a more elaborate conversation on that at a yeah. at another point in time. As I do have one more question for you now. Uh, of course. Uh, and I'm I'm curious about this too. How do you see webcams um, advancing conservation uh, now and in in the future? Well, that's a really good question, Mike. Um, I always like to bring things back down to fundamentals because with all this technology and speed at which we operate, it's really easy to get lost. So let's first start with fundamentals. And I think we see it at Katmai. The webcam, by the way, the webcam with the right people, people like you, Mike Fitz, who are so articulate on it, our Ranger Naomi and everyone, that really helps a lot. Um, they open the door to allow people to create relationship with the natural world. And I've always believed that you take care of what you love and people truly love these webcams. And in particular, since we're talking about Katmai, the Katmai cam. Otis just was declared the fat bear winner. We've created an Otis fund challenge. And if I'm correct, it's already over $35,000 in one day, not even 24 hours. And I believe that's because people have fallen in love. We take care of what we, um, what we care about. And so I always go back to that with the webcams. And it's great when you're showcasing such beautiful organizations and selfless leaders. And I still believe that that's the power of the webcam is to give people access and views to sacred places around the world that they would never see. And, you know, I always say this too. Sometimes a webcam might not be as excited as a nature video, but a nature video has been manipulated to make you feel something. But a webcam is giving you purity. And purity in our world today is the highest form of currency. Everything is being sold to you. So you really get to allow the world unfold in the most objective way. And from an educational standpoint, that's, you know, I mean, can you imagine all the great animal researchers, the Jane Goodalls and everyone, if they had webcams at their disposal as well. I mean, it allows you to study nature in such a pure way that never could be done before. So I, I think it's very exciting. You know, clearly, I don't have a crystal ball, but I still go back to the fundamentals. Uh, you take care of what you love, and I think the webcams provide that pathway. Well, well stated. Um, that's a great way, I think, to conclude. Um, you know, this uh, short Q&A that I had with you. So thanks so much, Charlie, Charlie for uh, sharing your insight. I, uh, I know bear stewards everywhere appreciate your efforts to support bears. And I enjoyed uh, our little conversation right now.
Uh, well, you're welcome. And, you know, to all the bear lovers and to all the nature lovers out there, just know that explore.org is a home away from home. And we have the best team, staff, nonprofit leaders who are here who just love to teach. So take advantage of us. And, you know, we love having everyone on board. And that was Charlie Annenberg, founder of Explore.org. You can watch Brown Bears at Brooks River every day on Explore.org slash bears. All right. Have a great day. And let's all get ready to hibernate. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks to Charlie for taking the time to speak with me and share his insights with us. We did have a couple of viewer comments and questions come in. And before we get to our next segment, we'll try to maybe mention those. We did have one comment, I think, from uh, Kelly, uh, who was talking about uh, what the webcams mean. Um, and being homebound uh, means that webcams of bears is available and being there for me. Thank you, Explore. And yes, I think a lot of people, uh, you know, would love to travel to Katmai, but that's an experience that's difficult for a lot of us, whether we experience barriers uh, physically or mentally or culturally or money or, or time, whatever it happens to be. Um, but the webcams help us to bridge some of those, some of those barriers. Um, so thanks for that comment. Um, Sarah, there was a question though that I wanted to um, uh, ask you though, and um, we'll actually before we get to that one, one quick one that I'll uh, answer here. This one comes from Susie. Susie, Susie was wondering where does the name Katmai come from? And the short answer is we don't know. Um, it, this seems like the meaning of that word has been lost to time. Uh, so we're not sure. Um, I, I wish we knew, um, but but we don't know that uh, for sure. Uh, and then, uh, Sarah, I wanted to throw this question to you. Uh, Tony on Facebook was asking, what did you do to study uh, for the job that you're doing right now? Sure. So I kind of had a, a, a roundabout way of, of doing what I'm doing now. I went to school both for um, art, so I have a degree in, in graphic design or graphic illustration rather, and then I also have a degree in uh, political science, um, which is mo mo mostly about um, environmental policy. That was kind of what it was concentrated in. Um, and I had actually, I worked in DC very briefly uh, before I kind of took a, a hard right and started working for more of these uh, conservation-based agencies. And um, that's that's kind of a, a very short uh, cliff note version <laughs> of, of how I ended up where I am now. But I think a lot of it is that I'm, I'm very inspired by the outdoors. So I'm really able to combine my art love of, of all that uh, with the environmental policy side of it too, to be able to bring a lot of these messages to people everywhere. So it's a little bit about my background. <laughs> I think there are many different avenues to take when you're, if you're thinking about a career in conservation or in national parks, for instance. So you could do a more classic route, maybe the one that I took where I went to school, studied specifically parks and recreation, and then ended up volunteering through organizations like the, the Student Conservation Association to get my foot in the door. Um, but there's a lot of other routes that you can go as well. So you can get creative with it, but I think having that curiosity and being inspired by the natural world is extremely important in those efforts. And speaking of inspiration, um, webcams, uh, you know, the, of the bear cams, they've inspired people all over the world in many different ways. Charlie was just talking about that. And I love to see that ins inspiration expressed through different mediums. Uh, many of you might know this, maybe you don't, but my co-host Sarah is a skilled artist. And if you've ever browsed the Catman Conservancy's website, uh, you've probably seen her work. If you've ever ordered a t-shirt, uh, you know, uh, you've probably, you're probably wearing her art and she's graciously agreed to talk about her artistic process. All right, I am going to guide you guys through uh, me drawing our uh, winner of this year, Otis. So I'm gonna share my screen and you can kind of see how I uh, digitally do this. Mike, just let me know when it finally decides to work. Okay. Are we there? There we are. Yep. Otis cool. is there. 
Awesome. So I want to kind of show you guys my thought process of when I when I start doing these. So what I do first is I sketch out this big line drawing that you can see here. And you can see that I it's just kind of like in big blocks. So this is like my first process, my first step into doing this entire thing. Um, and I'm going to throw in a lot of Bob Ross clips into this. So don't mind me. <laughs> yeah, I'm a big fan. Anyway, um, and then I'll look at my reference photo. And what I really like to take out of it is uh, the, the natural colors of whatever I'm drawing. So the program I'm using right now is called Adobe Illustrator. Um, I, when I first started off illustrating, I was such a purist. You know, I was I didn't do any digital illustration at all. I'm actually an oil painter. Uh, but then uh, from living in, in King Salmon and working at Katmai, it, it became a lot easier to do things digitally because I can send it via the internet and not have to worry about it getting lost in you know the bush mail out there. So that's kind of what really started it. Um, and then I, I designed the Junior Ranger book for Katmai as well. And now I, I put all of my uh, art energy into drawing uh, these fat bears, which is kind of a dream. <laughs> and so the, we're gonna start with uh, the process of how I kind of color block and put this together to make one giant awesome Otis. So we're going to start with his nose. You can see I have like just a million little lines down in here. And I like to zoom in really close because I'm all about the subtlety of color. So let's do this. And so I go over here and use this dropper tool, if you can see it. Um, and we'll start with this one. Dropper tool. And then I find, I choose my color palette from the colors that I see on Otis itself. Because I, the way I see it is that um, nature is so beautiful on its own that I don't, need to manipulate the colors. I can just use the colors and kind of bring them out a little bit more. Um, so all the colors and stuff that you see in my art are all taken directly from nature. I don't, I don't really mess with them at all. Um, so yeah, so I start with this, uh, you know, kind of like a base color here. And if anybody has any questions about my art process or just generally how I do this, um, feel free to jump in. Mike will share it with me and I, I'll, I'll be more than happy to answer them. Um, okay, and then we're going to come in and do a little bit of a lighter bit. So as you can see, I can see like these really tiny um, color variations. See where my pointer is over here. So it's like slightly lighter gray over here. So we're going to do that. And so what I also like to do is um, I will kind of do some of these base layers first, and then I will go in after and really start to work out like the fine details here. So it's just a little bit of a highlight on his nose. <laughs> it's cool to see all these um, animals so up close. You really kind of see the, the little differences and, and nuances of the color that they have. All right. So I think I'm going to actually draw another line in here in a little bit just to make it a little bit darker and differentiate the top from the bottom. But I'm going to work on the snout and everything around it first. And so he's eating a little piece of a fish here. <laughs> it looks like he's got like the tail of a salmon. Um, and that's why I chose this particular reference drawing uh, for this because uh, I, who doesn't like Otis eating salmon on a, on a shirt. <laughs> so this will be the design um, that I will be using for for this year's um, Fat Bear Week. It's actually, it's pretty great because um, it's always like a lot of fun because I try to guess who it is beforehand so I can get started on it. And I, I didn't know which way it was going to go, like if it was going to go Walker or Otis, but I kind of had a feeling Otis was going to win. So then I just like rush and try to draw this and get this done so I can get it out the door for all of you guys. Um, and it's a lot of fun. It's really great. I love that it it helps the uh, the cat my conservancy, which is really important to me. Um, and that let's see. Now we're gonna do some lighter stuff over here. And so a lot of people um, like illustrators and whatnot. A lot of people work with like layers and stuff, and I do too, definitely. But I kind of treat my work as a painting itself so i like to see how the colors like kind of interact with each other so i'm one of those crazy people that'll work all on one layer um <laughs> so i have to really go in and, and be pretty particular about about what i'm doing here all right so we got kind of a bit of his nose in here let's see let's try and do like his snout and bring that down he can start to take shape a little bit here look at his and I like to like mess around and be like, what color is going to be the best one? I like that one. That one works pretty well. 
Um, and then let's see here. I'm going to bring it all the way back, actually. Make sure I'm not missing anything. Great. Uh, so are there any questions from anyone that would like to know about like how I draw this? Like what got me into it? I actually, I do have a question for you. The the few what times I've tried to, to draw animals, Sarah, I've, it seems like <laughs> if you don't get the eyes right, the, the illustration or painting, whatever it happens to be, just sort of falls apart. So I'm, I'm wondering <laughs> if that, if, if you share that opinion and, and how, how much attention do you put into the eyes making sure get, and getting I put right? a, Yeah. So you totally nailed it. Like the eyes are so important for animals. And I mean, like you can do like simple weird ones, which I do sometimes when I like design the, uh, like the logos for fat bear week and all that. But, um, when I'm, when I'm drawing a piece like this, like let's, let's just zoom in to, to how many lines I use in this eye alone. <laughs> yeah. Um, see, so, you know, we've got his eye, we've got his like actual eyeball in there. And then we have like the different parts of the light in there. So it's really important that when you are doing eyes of animals is to look at where the reflections are within the eye. And that kind of brings it to life a little bit more. So again, it's again, it's about like looking at like really subtle differences in colors and that subtlety like really brings this, the work alive. So if we look over here at Otis's eye here, he's kind of got like a dark part here and it gets a little bit lighter and then there's a highlight up there and you can see where the light kind of shines through the eye. And that's, that's, I think what gives it life. Um, so yeah, I totally agree. Like if you're going to do anything, focus on on the eyes to kind of uh bring it to life a little bit more you got this mike i believe in you <laughs> <laughs> well thanks um and thanks for sharing your your artwork um with us today yeah. I, mean, I, um, I think a lot of people will um find it find it very interesting and a lot of people enjoy of course um you know sh having your artwork on a mug or you know a, a, um, or a t-shirt whatever it happens to be so um Cool. It's been fascinating, and, and I look forward to seeing this final product. This will be great. Yeah, it's going to be awesome. I'm I'm excited to show everybody. <laughs> and art is one of the many ways to, uh, to connect with and and celebrate national parks uh, in the stories they contain. Um, and we did have uh, a few other comments uh, about what the webcams and Exploded.org means uh, to everybody. Um, this comment comes from Susie Q. Uh, who writes, thank you, Charlie, for the phenomenal Explore.org. It has brought so much happiness and joy and awe to millions of people around the world. Uh, Mama Bear, uh, number six, uh, writes, as someone who battled depression for years, these bears and the cams have been a lifeline for me, a reason to go on. So thank you very much for sharing that. And I'm glad you were able to find um, some solace in our webcams. And then finally, um, Sue Elf writes, when the world was in lockdown, all these cams and especially watching bears kept me sane. And um, you're not alone there. Uh, so, um, so yes, thanks you, thank you for uh, for those those comments. Um, real real quick, Sarah, we did have um, uh, a couple of questions about your artwork coming in, um, and uh, one person was wondering: Is fur hard to draw? So. Um, <laughs> So how do you deal with that? How do you deal with that texture? It, depends. it, it kind of depends on um, how detailed I feel like getting with it. Um, if you look at some of my, my stuff that you even see, like the Cat My Kids Services webpage and the shirt that I'm wearing, which is last year's 747, um, I just look for uh, uh, like color variations, like kind of the way the light hits it. I always think it's, um, I, I kind of take my inspiration from um, impressionist painters because they like to draw light and how it affects and makes everything look. So that's kind of how I draw fur, is that I will look at where the light is hitting the fur, and then um, I'll kind of like color block what that light looks like and how it like comes into kind of the darker areas under the belly and all that stuff too. If I really want to get detailed with it, I will go in and actually draw every single uh, little uh, color variation in there. Um, if anybody has ever been um, actually to Brooks Camp and they recently in the past, I think since 2016, the uh, Falls Trail sign there is actually one that I illustrated and that I illustrated um, in a much different way that I than I am showing you today. So that was one of my more like very detailed sketch of, of fur. 
that's a complicated thing to do for sure. And it's one you can get kind of lost in. <laughs> so maybe you have to yeah. pick and choose which, which direction you're going to take. Uh, but thank yeah. Thanks again for sharing your art. Um, and we all look forward to seeing that final product of, of that, um, that illustration you're working on. Um, so again, like I mentioned before, share, um, you know, art is a way to connect with and celebrate national parks and, and gaining a greater knowledge of these places is another. Part of the Katmai Conservancy's mission is to expand our knowledge of Katmai. And as part of that effort, the Conservancy not only supports research related to brown bears, but also how we relate to brown bears. And soon after I began interacting with the bear cam audience uh, in 2013, I became convinced that webcams are powerful conservation tools. Uh, still, I had a lot of questions about the webcam experience. In particular, I wondered if a person's connection to the individual bears seen on the bear cams translated to greater overall support for the conservation of bears and their habitats. Thankfully, I wasn't the only person who was curious to find an answer. Many of our viewers might remember that you had an opportunity to participate in a bear cam viewer survey in 2019 and 2020. Back in May, I interviewed the researchers I worked with to develop that survey. We're still analyzing the results, but what we found so far is, I think, pretty fascinating. So here's part of my conversation with Dr. Lynn Lewis, professor of economics at Bates College in Maine, Dr. Leslie Richardson, an economist with the National Park Service, and Dr. Jeffrey Skibbins, a professor of recreation and park management at East Carolina University. So Lynn, Leslie, Jeff, uh, great to speak with you once again. Thanks for being here. Let's, let's talk about the, the premise of the research now. Uh, the vast majority of wildlife conservation science focuses on entire populations of animals or substantial changes in those populations. So how can the surveys of webcam audiences help aid uh, conservation? The bear cams offer a unique opportunity to watch and learn about individual bears. And I think this connection helps us understand the importance of conservation and perhaps even value conservation more. Um, from an economic standpoint, there have been a few studies looking at how the public values things like the reintroduction of wolves in Yellowstone or preventing the extinction of some endangered species. But there's not much out there about how people value animals at the individual level. So that was an important focus of this research. And what separated the bear camp survey from the bulk of um, the existing research? Jeff, would you kind of agree that it's really kind of like that focus on the individual that we that we tried to tease out in this survey? It, it is. It, these are um, it, it, a great new tool for conservationists and, and land managers to begin exploring. Uh, some preliminary research uh, that we've conducted has demonstrated that viewers online are capable of, of having very positive and strong responses uh, and, and aligned to the desired conservation outcomes uh, from, from watching the webcams. So, so now peeling back another layer and really digging into the, the individual nature of it because it is a little bit more of a structured experience compared to uh, being on site where you're very much at the whim of the bears, whereas uh, having the bear cam streaming, uh, you have a little bit more control and there's also some focus that's derived from where the cameras are. And so that lends itself to uh, helping visitors connect with individual animals. And so now what we're trying to see is, is how is that individual connection really uh, become a driver for some of the other experiences that would be analogous to being on site? And Lynn, why did we survey across uh, two summers? Our original plan wasn't to do that. That's right, it wasn't. Our original plan was, uh, I believe, to survey on site in 2020, but clearly that couldn't happen given the pandemic. However, both explore.org and our research team were really interested in how the pandemic affected wildlife watching. Most of us were stuck at home on screens and perhaps not surprisingly, there were many new viewers to the bear cams. Many of the comments we received suggested that wildlife viewing provided a needed relief and some joy to a very stressful year um, and to both new viewers and seasoned viewers, but many new viewers discovered the cams because they were at home. And there was a major part of the survey um, that focused on like a scenario, a scenario uh, associated with the threats to bears in the Katmai region. So Leslie, can you explain the design of that section and what you were aiming to measure? 
Yeah, so as environmental economists, Lynn and I are really interested in understanding how people value our public lands and the resources they support. You know, we know wildlife is important to a lot of people, but we don't have much information about the economic benefits associated with the preservation of wildlife in our national parks. So cat mice, brown bears in this example. So that's what we were really trying to measure here. And, you know, economics is, of course, just one way to look at the value of wildlife, but putting things in dollar terms by asking people what they would be willing to pay for the conservation of brown bears, it really helps us understand the value they place on that resource in a way that allows it to be compared to other things that people value. And what did you uh, discover from the survey answers? Uh, maybe Leslie, I can, uh, or excuse me, Lynn, I can throw that one back to you. Yeah, no, we found a very high value for cat mice brown bears. In fact, we found a willingness to pay to protect one brown bear of $70 per person per year. In other words, we calculated an average value of $70 per person to avoid the loss of an individual bear. And multiplying this number by the number of respondents in our survey resulted in a value of $260,000 to avoid the loss of one brown bear. And we calculated a premium of an additional $40,000 for a bear they've seen on screen. So this is pretty remarkable. Those are some pretty incredible numbers. And I think that helps to illustrate just how much we value, um, you know, these animals in, a, in our own lives, whether we're, um, you know, standing on the platforms at Katmai, or if we're watching, you know, halfway around the world. And we'll get to the individual animals um, and how that relates to conservation caring and the economics analysis in just a little bit. But in general, Jeff, regarding the conservation caring uh, analysis. What has that just broadly um, suggested in our, when you're when you're looking at those numbers? So people are able to form really strong and high connections to the bears from watching them on the webcams. Uh, the 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 results that we're seeing uh, again the the looking at just the bears on the on the webcam, the results indicate a very strong and high level of emotional connection people are able to form. And that and this is again, uh, parallel and essentially indistinguishable from the uh, results that would happen from being on site. And let's talk about the, the, the effect of the individual animal. Lynn, I'll throw this one out, out to you. Uh, what has the survey illuminated about the value of individual animals. You mentioned a bit of a premium earlier. Yeah, so the bear cams help people connect with individuals and the interpretation programs do the same as people learn about individuals and their lives. And some viewers expressed willingness to pay more for bears that they recognized. Over half our respondents have a favorite bear or bears. And we found people watch longer when the bear they can identify is on the screen. And in general, people who said they're able to identify bears were willing to pay more into the trust fund. So we were able to calculate a premium for bears um, that respondents had viewed on the screen. Very popular bears like 480 Otis or Holly or 503, they pull up the value of the average bear, it turns out. So we're currently developing a model of wildlife viewing that explicitly incorporates the idea that wildlife watchers consider some individuals within a population as more charismatic perhaps more interesting. And so that raises the value of the entire animal population. And this has important, important implications for determining compensation in cases of accidental death uh, of an animal or intentional death of an animal. And it's an improvement in our opinion to current approaches to wildlife valuation. Jeff, what about the, the conservation caring element and individual bears? How does a person's connection to individuals influence conservation caring scores? So, so we saw um, a, a tremendous increase in conservation caring scores for individuals who could identify uh, specific animals on screen compared to those who couldn't. So the ability of, of an individual, of, of a human to watch these webcams and identify specific bears uh, was a strong stimulus in increasing their, uh, their ability to connect to these animals and to form that emotional response. Uh, but just some final questions for everyone now. Uh, what's the potential, um, you know, for this study, you know, going going forward? Uh, Leslie, how can we maybe apply the value of bears and individual bears um, to wildlife conservation? 
Yeah, I think, you know, from this survey, we found that people understood the willingness to pay question and they do place an economic value on the preservation of bears at the individual level. We didn't really have any information on this, so this research was very helpful. And while cat mice bears are, of course, pretty unique, we're hoping to use a similar approach to look at the value of other wildlife species in other parks, potentially. And we can use these types of economic benefit measures to evaluate regulations that affect wildlife, or as Lynn mentioned, to assess the damages when animals are unfortunately either intentionally or accidentally killed in national parks. Um, while Katmai luckily doesn't have a big problem with this, many other parks do. So understanding the loss to the public when this happens is really important. And for me, um, knowing more about how people are connecting to individual bears helps, I think, inform my interpretation of the bears themselves. If I can give people the tools overall to um, recognize like Otis or Holly or 503, a lot of those really charismatic bears that we've mentioned, that uh, seems to be really kind of like a gateway to um, people connecting with the larger population and wanting to protect the larger population of bears, not only in Katmai, um, but elsewhere. Um, well, this has been um, a wonderful conversation. I'm, I'm grateful that you uh, were able to take the time to explore and explain um, you know, some of these results with the Bear Cam audience, many of whom were very generous with their time. Thousands of you, thank you very much. You're very generous with your time um, to fill out that survey and help us give us this information and we can help uh, you know, better protect uh, wildlife and wildlands everywhere. Um, but yeah, once again, thanks. Um, Jeff, Leslie, Lynn, um, I'm looking forward to seeing, uh, you know, what else we can discover through this information. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Thank you. And once again, thanks to everyone who participated in that survey. You can watch my full conversation with my research partners on Explore.org's Bears and Bison YouTube channel. That should be available uh, uh, fairly soon at the end of this broadcast. Uh, and as part of that research effort, the Katmai Conservancy has gener generously agreed to provide a grant so Drs. Lewis, Richardson, and Skibbins and me can uh, develop a companion survey of people who physically visit Brooks River. This will allow us to compare and contrast the webcam experience with the on-site experience. And I'll be sure to share our results with everybody once they are uh, published. Uh, and more comments about what the bear cams mean to um, to people at home, uh, uh, Jot Jot uh, writes, uh, the webcams and the bears feed my soul. Uh, they bring me joy, peace, happiness, and laughter. Thank you, Charlie, and explore.org. And then Silver Birch writes, the bear cams have been a lifeline this past year. Uh, I have long COVID and I am unable to go hiking like I usually do. I'm stuck on the sofa under my laptop. Well, I hope you get well, Silver Birch, and um, I'm yeah, glad man. that the bear cams have given you um, some uh, some connection to the outdoors while you're while you're healing, uh, Sarah. We you know just got done with a giant event though that also engaged people all around the world, and it was really fun to see what Fat Bear Week 2021 brought us. Yeah, yeah. Um, so first of all, thank you, Mike, for engaging in all of that research. It's really incredible and, and fascinating, and it really truly helps with uh, the management and experience at Katmai. So the question that everyone always wants to know that how did Fat Bear Week even begin? So I think we should take a few minutes and, and chat with you about how the best week of the year came into fruition. Um, so Mike, before we get right into it, can you kind of give us a recap of uh, this year's Fat Bear Week? Yeah, real quick, we started out with 12 bears. Uh, we had almost 800,000 votes total. We wound up with just one champ, and that was number 480 Otis, who the public chose over 151 Walker. I think a lot of people uh, went for Otis this year because of his story of resilience and perseverance. He came back really skinny at the end of July, but he plumped up quite nicely. He's even fatter now. We see him on the webcams like today and yesterday. He's looking really good for himself. So um, Otis could return as, uh, you know, for, for another season at Brooks River. And I think a lot of people are looking forward uh, to that possibility. Uh, but getting back to your question, though, about how Fat Bear Week started, it was kind of something that we um, discovered almost at chance. I was working in the visitor center at Katmai in late September 
or early October um, back in 2014, and I saw a webcam viewer post in the comments uh, a before and after picture, basically the same bear that we saw on our webcams. And, uh, and they were like, hey, look at the difference. And I thought, well, wouldn't it be kind of neat if we paired up individual bears and we got people to pick who they thought was the fattest bear of the year. So we threw together a quick thing, um, quick tournament bracket. We put it in, uh, into the park's Facebook page. People voted with their likes. It was so well received that year that I decided to expand it into a whole week the following year to give me more people the opportunity to participate. And that's how Fat Bear Week began. That's awesome. <laughs> it's a really cool story. So was it always as popular as it is now? It, it was popular, but not like now. I mean, it's grown exponentially since then. And I think that's to the credit of the people I work with at Explore.org and also to the park rangers who have taken on Fat Bear Week. Uh, since I left my position with the park itself. They've done a lot of good work over the last several years to professionalize it. And it's, it's, it's grown quite a lot. Again, uh, 800, 000, almost 800,000 votes this year. I did not expect that to happen. That's absolutely wild. So how are the bears chosen for Fat Bear Week? Well, the bear has to be present in early summer and in late summer. Uh, we So we need to be able to get photographs of those bears so we can see the before and after um, differences, um, the amount of body mass that they end up gaining, because that helps to illustrate how much work they've done throughout the year. Well, we also will consider different stories of the bears, um, because I think that's an important component of Fat Bear Week is those storylines behind the individual bears. What have they experienced? during the year itself. So photographs, whether they've been present all year and storylines, it is difficult to choose, to be honest, because there's so many different bears along the river that can teach us so much. So it is it is hard to just narrow it down to 12 bears. And it's hard to get those pictures. <laughs> Speaking from experience. So. <laughs> yeah. So what's the biggest difference between Fat Bear Week now and then when it first began? Well, one thing that we started doing this year was Fat Bear Junior, and um, that was an idea that the Rangers came up with uh, because people wanted, I think, an opportunity to look at more cubs. Uh, so we gave it to them. Um, and, and then also, I think how much it's grown, how much media attention it gets. Uh, first couple Fat Bear Weeks really didn't get too much. There might be, you know, somebody shared like Facebook posts and stuff like that, but there wasn't really a whole lot of media attention. But almost major, every major news outlet has at least one online story about it uh, this year. And it was trending on Twitter for a little bit. So it's really, uh, I think, a remarkable opportunity for people to just for a moment consider fat brown bears and why they get fat to survive and maybe think about the ecosystem that supports them. That's awesome. And um, of course, I got to ask, what is your favorite thing about Fat Bear Week? I I love seeing people celebrate the bears. I mean, it, it seems like people get so excited about um, campaigning for their favorite bears and um, and sharing those bears stories. And I, I, I think that's wonderful. That, that that brings me a lot of joy when I when I see that. That's awesome. I agree. Uh, just even walking about Alaska and, and hearing people talk about Fat Bear Week just here locally, um, it's it's just touched so many people everywhere. And so just thank you for, for doing all that you do with Fat Bear Week. Um, so again, thanks so much for kind of giving us the overview of, of Fat Bear Week and its origins. Um, we had, like you said, a record amount of votes this year. So let's hope we can break that record again next year. Um, so we also decided to have a little fun with the voting. Uh, we created several uh, superlative categories to highlight other achievements and personalities of the bears at Brooks Falls. So let's uh, let's get right into it. Yeah, our first category that we had uh, uh, voted on on YouTube was a few days ago, and this one was for best pro wrestler. And it should be, to no one's surprise, the best pro wrestler this year was 128 Grazer. Uh, so who can forget Grazer's defensiveness this summer? She was among the river's most dominant adult bears. And I can't wait to see the TikTok videos that feature Grazer beating up on other bears with a soundtrack set to the Ultimate Warriors entrance music. So people make sure that happens. We have I'll, another I'll category sure that though happens. that's, yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, we had another category, Sarah, that um, that was voted on the same day, most likely to become dominant. Who did the people choose there? 
We chose 8112. Um, and I will be really curious to see how that goes. Um, and I, I find him to be a very pretty bear. <laughs> He's very shapely. <laughs> so I, I support this. <laughs> what are your thoughts, Mike? Oh yeah, I mean he's he's a big bear for his age, so we could easily see him transition into a very dominant adult um, in the coming years. So that's something to watch for. One of those storylines. Next up was uh, best bear butt, and who had the cutest butt? And uh, actually, a little bit to my surprise, I thought people might go with Holly on this one, but they chose number one five one Walker. Uh, there's a reason that National Park Rangers this year described Walker as more orb than bear. He has a giant behind, and I think that's a sign of his success overall. The next category, though, was for uh, most photogenic, uh, Sarah, and uh, that's yes, a with, uh, that's a tough choice for a lot of people. But who did who did people choose? My my lady Holly, <laughs> four three five. Pretty excited about that, and like, how could you not? She's got the beautiful blonde coat. Um, and oh, on her ears, also some of my favorite uh, characteristics about her. And, you know, typically when she doesn't have cubs, she just gets like super fat and huge. And, you know, she is she's gorgeous. And I agree with this with this winner 100 <laughs> percent. Then next up was most improved angler. And uh, the winner of this category, actually, we don't have an identification number for as of yet. Um, the park rangers uh, are, and park staff are still waiting to assign that number or seeing if this bear is a, um, a bear previously ID'd that we just haven't figured out yet. Uh, he was one of the most enjoyable bears to watch this summer for me. I mean, he innovated a new fishing position at the base of Brooks Falls, and that's not something I'd ever seen uh, a brown bear do before. Um, so I'm looking forward to seeing what that bear has in store in the future. Next category, though, Sarah, was for best angler. Yeah, of course, we have 480 Otis. <laughs> I'm also very happy about this. And he really does have a, a really great fishing technique where he uses like very little bit amount of energy, just hangs out in his little spot, you know, the office and waits for the fish to come to him. So he's very successful in not using a lot of energy while also gaining as many calories as he possibly can. And we could see too from this year, from the beginning of, from the end of July, when he finally rolled in to now, he made quite a substantial change in, in weight gain. Oh, and then we have our next one, most respected mom. <laughs> Yes, Otis is a respected bear. We had people vote on who was the most respected mother. And the people chose 128 Grazer once again. Uh, D Grazer's defensiveness and ability to care for her hungry yearlings, I think, uh, is the reason that people chose her. She's respected by her Ursid peers and by the people who watch the cameras. Today, uh, we had one final um, superlative, Sarah. And that was life of the party. Which uh, which oh, yeah. bear you would want um, to join you in the in the crowd of bears at Brooks River? I could totally see this. We have eight one twelve, <laughs> and it's you know he's a he's a younger bear, but he is just you know he loves to play, and I really love that he's still doing that. <laughs> so I I really enjoy watching him do that, and just kind of you can really see his personality coming through, especially in these videos that you see here. Uh, so 100% he's the life of the party. Everyone invite him. <laughs> and those are our 2021 Cat My Bear, Bear Camp Superlatives as chosen by the public. Thanks to everyone who voted on our YouTube page. Uh, however, I think we need to also to recognize a few additional bears and special moments. So now Sarah and I will introduce our judges' choice superlatives for the year. First on, on tap here is a blooper of the summer. Oh yeah, how could we not forget this <laughs> with uh, 806 falling off the falls and her yearlings like, what happened? <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> good blooper, happens to us all, <laughs> fair enough. So we have our next one, uh, most likely to be in GQ. Yeah, and, and Popeye was in one of the, the, one of the choices for um, most photogenic, uh, but you know, I think we have to recognize that he's a handsome bear. So he wasn't selected for most photogenic, but there's no denying how handsome he is. And despite being an older adult male, he's so far avoided accumulating a lot of the wounds and scars commonly seen on bears his age. So he's a good looking guy. But we have a female for uh, this category as well, Sarah. Yep, we got Miss 
482. Ooh, I could totally see that. <laughs> like, look how pretty she is. No surprise there at all. I mean, obviously I am a, a Holly fan, but you know, look, she is also a very beautiful bear. She's another one I really like to photograph too and draw because of just her beautiful kind of facial structure and um, her general like body formation too. And then I, our next judge's choice is about dominance in the river, most likely to remain dominant. And for this one, I had to go with 747. <laughs> most people probably aren't surprised by that. Yeah. 747 remains the largest brown bear I've ever seen. And for many years, he was subordinate uh, to the dominance of bear 856. Yet he appears so healthy and so big that I believe there's a great chance he'll remain the river's most dominant male next summer and that's a storyline i think for us to follow uh, for bear cam 2022 going from dominance though to tolerance um sarah who uh who did we choose as most tolerant again so uh, my girl holly 435 and i can i can totally see this too you know i i think as many cam viewers know about uh, a bunch of years ago when holly even uh, adopted a cub even that that experience alone just shows how tolerant she is of other bears and it kind of what an incredible just like mother she is too so big fan of holly and we have one more uh judge's choice superlative to share and that's the tender moment of the year with this one i had to go with grazer nursing her yearlings uh, grazer provided us with many remarkable moments this year and this was i think one of the most relaxing bear camp scenes that we witnessed and quite a contrast to some of the other behaviors that we saw grazer express uh this summer so a remarkable scene captured on our on our webcams and those are our 2021 bear camp superlatives uh, we we love Katmai's brown bears for their individuality, adaptability, perseverance, resiliency, uh, and many other things. Katmai National Park supports some of the highest densities of bears in the world, yet we can never forget that Katmai's bear population is the product of, health, uh, of a healthy environment and the last great runs of salmon left on earth. So let's take a moment now to consider the lives of salmon and what that means, not only for Katmai's brown bears, but to the people and other organisms who call this place home. And this is what I call my ode to salmon. In late winter and spring, hundreds of millions of new lives emerge from the gravel bottomed headwaters of Bristol Bay in Southwest Alaska. The tiny salmon fry have no inkling of the odds they face, nor do they understand the role they play in the ecosystem. Yet these fish have an outsized impact on the lands and waters of their home. And the only thing that will prevent them from fulfilling their life's work is death. After one to two years in fresh water, sockeye smolt begin their journey to the ocean. They must dodge flocks of hungry birds and schools of trout on their way to the sea. In the ocean, they must avoid sharks and whales while they circumnavigate the North Pacific over two to three years. Salmon do not reproduce in the ocean though. To pass on their genes to the next generation, they return to their place of birth. Upon their return to Bristol Bay, they encounter a fishing fleet, almost 2,000 boats strong, each boat and crew aiming to reap the incoming bounty. This is a continuation of a human story that extends across thousands of years of history in the North Pacific region. The salmon's upstream journey through freshwater is no less dangerous or impactful. When they return to Brooks River, about 60 miles from the sea and far from the commercial fishing fleet, Salmon encounter dozens of ravenous brown bears. Over the summer, a single large brown bear might consume several thousand pounds of salmon in its effort to gain the fat reserves necessary to survive winter hibernation. If the salmon evade the bears, they experience one final battle, one that none of them will survive. Near its spawning site, a sockeye transforms into a green-headed, ruby-bodied jewel. Male salmon guard access to females, while the females grind their tail fins raw in the effort to dig a nest in the gravel. And when the time is right, the pair releases eggs and milk simultaneously. Within a few days of, the, of this event, certainly within a week, they die of exhaustion. A sake salmon's journey is an odyssey. The salmon aren't marooned or shipwrecked by spiteful gods, but they arguably endure even greater trials. Every stage of their life is filled with significant risk. But along the way, salmon enrich the places they inhabit. 
In Bristol Bay, salmon support a billion dollar sustainable fishing industry. Thousands of people from all over the world travel to this area to watch the brown bears who eat the salmon or fish for the trophy sized rainbow trout that get fat on salmon fry and eggs. Salmon allowed people to occupy Brooks River nearly continuously for the last 5,000 years. The food and nutrients they bring to freshwater feed everything from microorganisms to plants to hungry bears to wolves to people. When we see a nearly dead salmon settle to the bottom of Brooks River, her skin mangled and worn from the arduous journey to spawn, it may seem like a tragic end for such a formerly powerful fish. From her perspective, though, she is triumphant. Brooks River and Katmai National Park are home to millions of triumphant salmon each year. At the peak of the salmon run, when processing plants and salmon boats thrum with activity on the shores of Bristol Bay, when the waters at Brooks Falls boil with fish, when bears and gulls lounge with stomachs and gullets distended with salmon, we witness an ecosystem whose potential is fully realized. Let us never forget what salmon provide and what we risk if we lose them. Thank you so much, Mike. It was a very beautiful and poignant ode to salmon, which are the lifeblood of Katmai. You really describe their raw life cycle in a very touching and informative way. Um, so we do have a very special award that is also very well warranted. Let's hear it for the winner of the prestigious Lifetime Achievement Award. He comes in, he does his job. No fuss, no drama, just gets it done. Head down, fishing sweetly and majestically. He starts out thinner than the rest, and every year he winds up fat. His teeth are worn and his old bones hurt, and nevertheless he persists. He is the king, and yet he is all of us. We are all 480 Otis. Stacy Schmeidel. Days slip past in June and then July. It was hard to hold out hope of seeing the mighty bear we affectionately called Otis. I was very scared he was never coming back, but he never gives up. Otis is a special bear. He is the oldest bear in Catman, and he came in so scrawny with ribs showing in July. I was very worried and sad thinking he had died and so elated when Otis arrived in late July. Otis was first identified at Brooks River as an older subadult or young adult in 2001. Over the last several years, he's become one of the most recognizable and beloved brown bears in the world. Today, Otis is a proven survivor, despite facing the challenges posed by age and other bears. He exemplifies patience, perseverance, and skill in brown bears. We admire Otis for his ability to adapt to changing circumstances, his resilience in the face of challenge, and for his focus and patience as he makes a living in a tough and competitive environment.
Definitely a very well-deserved award for an, an awesome bear that I think has inspired a lot of people. So we want to thank you all for tuning in and celebrating these animals that fascinate and inspire us. Katmai National Park and Preserve is truly a special place. Thousands of salmon breathe life into this perfectly designed ecosystem that provides a home to these incredible brown bears. Volcanic ash and colors paint the landscape and provide examples of destruction and rejuvenation. This landscape is not immune to change, however. As the climate changes, so does the natural flow of things. It's important to not just acknowledge how special these bears are, but how much change can affect their home and the salmon that they rely on. Your contributions and awareness truly makes a difference in the well-being of the bears at Katmai. Thank you on behalf of the Katmai Conservancy for being a part of the incredible place that is Katmai National Park and Preserve. Well said, Sarah. Places like Katmai can't exist without the support of people. We hope you'll join our efforts to protect Katmai, wild spaces and wildlife everywhere. Katmai, I think, is a beacon of hope in a world that is wounded by human-driven climate change and mass extinction. But there's a lot to save everywhere and for everyone if we make that effort. So be sure to vote for people who will work to tackle the climate crisis. Be sure to support sustainable fisheries like that in Bristol Bay. And if you can, please donate to our matching fundraiser, the Otis Fund, which ends at midnight tonight. Explore.org will match all donations up to a total of $250,000. I would like to thank Sarah for being here uh, today and, and um, sharing her artwork with everybody and being a great co-host. I want to thank the staff at Explore.org for all of the work that they've done to put together this broadcast and help support the webcams. The, of course, the National Park Service and all the rangers who work to protect Katmai and the, the fine folks who also work with the Katmai Conservancy. Uh, Thanks to all our guests who joined us today. My name is Mike Fitz. My co-host was Sarah Woolman from the Catmite Conservancy. Enjoy the bear cams and have a great day.